Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad that you joined into the presentation today. Uh, my name is Chris Sincar, and I'll take a minute to introduce myself more fully uh, momentarily. Our topic for today is something that's a little bit different in entrepreneurial circles. I want to talk about franchising. And what's very interesting is that not a, a lot of people think about franchising as an entrepreneurial activity, but what it really is, is you taking a business model that other people have used and adapting it to your local market as a local individualized startup. So I think it's actually a really interesting hybrid within the franchising, within the entrepreneurial world of how this collision of franchising and startups come together. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to approach this topic by really looking at the opportunities in franchising through FAQs. Uh, so I'll propose to you some of the questions that I'm often asked, and then I'll also answer them in full. So just in terms of an agenda for today, I'm going to take a minute to introduce myself in a little more detail, and then we're really going to dig into the what I'll really think of as the top 10 uh, FAQs, and then we'll take a look at next steps. If this has intrigued you and you want to explore this in a little more detail, we'll talk about how we can do that together. All right, so in way of background, uh, the picture on here is the uh, younger, better looking version of me. Um, but just in way of background. So I started my career as a CPA. Um, I have a finance and accounting undergraduate degree. Uh, I also have an operations and strategy master's from the Tepper School. I started my career working for Arthur Anderson, and then I transitioned out of that big four firm and into working for one of my clients and then in industry. I left working for others uh, over 20 years ago. And so since 1999, I have worked for myself in a variety of different ventures. I have actually acquired six different businesses in four different industry verticals over the last 22 years. I had one true startup experience, <laughs> um, which for me, was a very enlightening experience. And I think it's actually something that helped me appreciate later on what franchising can bring to the table. For me, that true startup was a very difficult experience and it was a complete failure, all right? Over the last 22 years, I've actually been a franchise owner in multiple different franchise brands in very different spaces. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about my specific franchising experience and where that's brought us to. But I think it's been a really interesting transition that has been cumulative. I have also, since 2013, served in an advisory role. So I advise investors who want to invest in the franchising space, and I help them to be able to identify good franchises and franchises that match their particular investment criteria. And then along the way in the background, uh, since 2008, I've actually been on the faculty here at Carnegie Mellon, where I've taught as an adjunct professor in five different entrepreneurship classes over the years, revolving around business planning, business acquisitions, and franchising. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a picture of who I am and how I ended up here today. All right. Now, I'm going to give you my very clear pitch. I want you to be a business owner. <laughs> I don't think I could make that statement any clearer uh, than I just did. I have found business ownership in my career to be extremely rewarding, professionally, personally, financially. I just think it's a great career path. If I lined up in front of you a, a series of my business owner friends, and a series of my corporate executive friends. I will tell you that I think the career satisfaction of the business owners is simply higher. And so that is why I'm here today giving this presentation. That's why I still teach at the Tepper School, is I want the students and the Tepper community to be aware of all of the alternatives within entrepreneurship, because I think holistically, it's just a better career path that's gonna be more rewarding for you. Now, from my perspective, 
if you are transitioning out of a career path, a traditional corporate role, I believe that franchising is actually the ideal transition path. Because what it allows you to do is it allows you to move into a business where there's still scaffolding and there's still structure around you. So you have a lot of what you're used to in the corporate world, but you have upside opportunity that's completely unlimited. And so I think franchising really gives you the best of both worlds in entrepreneurship. It gives you support so that you're not by yourself, but it also gives you upside so that you don't have any type of ceiling that's holding you down. My role today as your presenter and in the long run, potentially as your advisor in this, I want to help you to get from one side to the other. I want to be the bridge that helps you to make this transition in your career path. So let's start digging into some of the most frequently asked questions. When I tell people what I do and how I'm involved in franchising, there's a series of questions that are honestly pretty predictable about what people want to know. And so what I'm gonna do today is just walk through those in a very deliberate path to start exploring franchising as I normally would in any other conversation uh, with the people that I talk to about this. All right, so this is absolutely positively the first thing that always comes up. When I tell people that I'm a franchise owner and a franchise consultant, they say, you mean like Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's? And so the answer is yes, but. <laughs> so here's the yes, but. Franchising is packed with very successful franchises that are food-based. McDonald's and Wendy's and Taco Bell and Dunkin' are all spectacular brands that have thousands and thousands of units and decades of success. So all of that's true, and I don't want to stand here and poo-poo any of those brands because I think they're all spectacular opportunities in their own right. But what I do want to present to you today is I want to present to you franchising as being far more diverse than that, all right? On the screen, I've presented to you four different industry segments that you may not initially think of as filled with franchises, but I'm here to tell you they're packed with franchises and franchises that are extraordinarily successful. So let's just walk through these to give you a deeper understanding of the breadth of franchising. So automotive, let's start here. When I go to have tires, inspections, and brake work done, I go to Meineke. There's one not too far from my house. They do a spectacular job on service, and they have a great brand reputation, 800 locations, 50 years of experience. It's a terrific, reputable brand. When I just need an oil change, there's a Jiffy Lube that's not more than two miles from my house. And so I use Jiffy Lube all the time. Those are both really successful examples of franchise brands. Now, in the automotive space, don't just think about automotive service. Remember that all of the new car dealerships, Toyota, Ford, all of the GM brands, those are all franchises. <laughs> Uh, they're very large and very complicated to operate, but those are all technically franchises as well. So I want you to realize that franchise opportunities are abound in the automotive space. All right. Now, an area where you might not ever think about franchising is actually in B2B services. So when you think about business to business opportunities, I want to tell you, I'm the franchise owner of a bookkeeping and accounting franchise called Supporting Strategies. The opportunity that Supporting Strategies gives us is they've built an entire suite of tools that for any one individual franchisee to build would be really difficult and cost prohibitive. But when you're spreading that investment across 100 units from coast to coast, it becomes a much more affordable opportunity. It becomes much easier to build big, successful tools. And that's exactly what Supporting Strategies has done. The exact same thing. Some of you who are sales professionals may have over the years taken training from Sandler. Sandler is also a franchise. They have regional franchise owners that really develop out of presence in any particular geography. All right. Think for a minute about healthcare. 
So most of us who are in Western Pennsylvania are used to thinking as healthcare being focused around UPMC and Allegheny Health. All right, and that's very true here in Western Pennsylvania. But what I want you to realize is sitting in the background, there are literally hundreds of franchise locations of many other businesses. So my grandmother, 99 years old and healthy as can be except for one challenge. Her hearing has been bad for 25 years. <laughs> um, so we are frequent visitors to Miracle Ear. Very successful franchise, uh, multiple locations in Pittsburgh, hundreds of locations across the country. And Miracle Ear is a great successful franchise. Right at Home is a great example of in-home senior care. That's a business that is dominated by franchise players. Uh, Synergy Home Care, Right at Home, uh, and dozens of others, honestly, uh, fill up that healthcare space. So don't just think about the big hospitals. Realize that there's a lot of other franchise players in that healthcare world. And then one space that I really want you to think about that once I say this, it's going to click for you, personal care and beauty services. That industry space is absolutely packed with successful franchise brands. So let's just think for a minute about massage and facials. So that space has Massage Envy, Massage Heights, Hand and Stone, Elements, Spavia, all national brands, very successful doing massages and facials. All right. Think about beauty. You have businesses such as Amazing Lash, Lash Lounge, Deca Lash, uh, Frenchies in the nail space. So there's all varieties of franchises that are filling up this beauty and personal services uh, space and doing a really good job of presenting a common brand and a great experience. So when you think about franchising, please realize this is bigger than just Duncan and McDonald's and Wendy's. This is a space that really has penetrated across the industry barriers into spaces that you may not initially think about. All right. Now, the second question that people always ask me in franchising is, okay, I understand the breadth of this. Can I really make good money at this? Is this something where I can create an income that replaces my corporate management salary? All right. When we talk about income, I really want to talk about two different subjects. All right. I want to talk about the total income ceiling, the potential for a franchise, but I think it's also important that we talk about how quickly are we going to ramp up from we're starting the business and have zero income to we've reached our stabilized income level. So let's talk about each of those in turn, all right? So income opportunity. Can you make $50,000 from a franchise? 100% yes, you can. Can you make $100,000? Yes. Could you make $250,000 a year from a franchise? Yes. All right, now, I wanna be clear. Does every franchise unit produce the same amount of income? No. There are some franchises that because of the structure of the business, they are intended to produce an average income of $50,000 per unit per year. There are some that are built to produce 100,000 or 250,000. So I want you to understand that the income opportunity for a given franchise is highly related to what the business is, all right? So you have to, as you're going through your investigation, make sure that you're clarifying from the existing franchise owners, what is the opportunity per location or per territory for that particular franchise, okay? So to be clear, I'm a, I'm a master franchise owner. I was with Liberty Tax Service. The income opportunity per territory with Liberty Tax Service is smaller than it is per territory with supporting strategies. Very different business models. Single territory, they're going to produce very different income levels. So I want you to be sensitive to the fact that you have to make sure you're doing your homework and that you understand what the opportunity is. Now, what if you want to produce a very large income? All right, you can do that in franchising, but the key to success in that is looking at multi-unit ownership. So you have to look at a business 
where you can eventually become the owner of two or four or six or eight locations over a period of time, where you can create a significantly larger market opportunity for yourself. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about Massage Envy being a very successful franchise. In that business model, the majority of their franchise owners own multiple locations. They own three or six or 10 or 12 locations. And it gives them an outsized income opportunity and allows them to build a team and create a very large income opportunity. So I will tell you in the long run, the income opportunity with many franchises is, is linked to becoming a multi-unit owner in that franchise. Now, speed to cash flow is the other really important consideration that I want you to think about, all right? Speed to cash flow in most businesses is going to take time to go up the curve. Now, how can you go up the curve faster? <laughs> That's the question that people ask me. So I'm going to tell you that there's three keys to going up the curve faster. First one, if you choose a business model where you can be an owner operator instead of a business model where you're going to hire a manager, you will go up the curve faster for two reasons. First, honestly, as the owner, you're going to be more motivated. You're going to drive the business harder than any hired employee that you're ever going to put in your business. So it will naturally, because of your effort, go faster. Second, you won't have to pay that person a salary. <laughs> so your overhead burden is going to be lower. And as a result, you'll reach profitability faster. Okay, second, choose a business that is services-based instead of retail-based. A services-based business, for example, like the bookkeeping and accounting franchise that I own, it has lower overhead burden. We don't have rent to pay. We don't have fixed hours that we have to keep. So as a result, we have higher variable cost, lower fixed cost, allows us to reach our profitability point sooner, okay? The third key to success. Choose a business that's B2C, not B2B. A B2C business, the sales cycle is just faster. It allows you to market, customer responds, you sell them a good. In B2B, that sales process is much more protracted. There are more stakeholders involved, and it just takes you longer to reach a sale. So all three of these together, choose an owner-operator model, services-based selling to B2C customers. And if you hit on all three of those items, it'll move you up that ramp up curve as quickly as you can. All right, so hopefully that gives you some flavor for the income ceiling, as well as how to move up that growth curve faster. All right, now here's question number three. People normally lean in for this one and they say, okay, Chris, let's, let's, let's cut to the chase. How much money does it really cost for me to invest in a franchise? All right. So here's what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> that question is very much related to you asking me, how much money does it cost to buy a house? It depends. <laughs> how many bedrooms do you want? Do you want a whole farm with 20 acres or are you looking for a little townhouse in the suburbs? All right. What I will tell you is the investment levels in general, I find to be very affordable. All right. Low end of the range, you can find good franchises where your investment's going to be $50,000. Likewise, on the other end, you can find really good franchise opportunities where your investment might be $3 million. Okay. There's not a correlation rate between spending more money and having more success. There is not. Okay, I want to be very clear about that. I would tell you that the vast majority of franchise companies have an investment level between $100,000 and $250,000. All right, now that $100,000 to $250,000 range, it includes all of your business expenses. It includes your franchise fee, your startup costs, your working capital. You may want to allocate more working capital, but in general, it includes an allowance for working capital. But I want to be very clear. It does not include your personal living expenses. So let's assume that you decide to invest in a supporting strategies franchise. All right. You're going to pay your franchise fee 
You're going to need some startup costs to get your office started. You're going to need some working capital to pay your bills and market the business. And all of that's going to be included in your business startup costs. But along the way, as you're starting the business, you still have to pay your mortgage. You still have to pay your utilities at home. You still have to put food on the table and gas in the gas tank. All of those are going to be incremental expenses that we need to add to your budget to make sure that you've allocated money to pay for them. But they're going to be there, and we have to make sure that we uh, have set up the right amount of money to pay for those as well. So hopefully that gives you some framework of what the investment level is that's required for each of these. All right. Now, closely related to question number three is the question of, okay, Chris, I understand the budget, 100 to 250,000 is a sweet spot, maybe more, maybe less. I don't have that much cash sitting around. And my answer to that is it's okay because we have a lot of financing alternatives. So let's take a minute to look at how financing works in the franchise world, all right? When you start thinking about financing alternatives, I want you to draw a really clear parallel between investing in a franchise and buying a house, all right? Because there's a lot of similarities. So when you go out to buy a house, most people are typically making a down payment and then taking on a mortgage to finance the difference because that allows them to invest in more house than they could otherwise afford if they were just paying cash, okay? The exact same premise is available when you're looking at franchise investments, okay? When you're looking at investing in a franchise, it's a combination of an equity down payment and a small business loan. Now, when you're buying a house, you're typically looking at a 10 to 20% down payment and a mortgage for the difference. I will tell you that when you're looking at a franchise investment, I want you to assume that you're going to need a cash down payment of 30% of the total investment. It's higher. And then you can take out a small business loan for the difference. Okay. And that's a general rule uh, that I'd like you to work with. In some instances, you may be able to get a bank who's a little more aggressive and might be willing to lend you 75 or 80%. Likewise, there might be some businesses where the bank might say, look, we'd like you to put in a 35 or 40% down payment. But I think as a general rule, the number we can work with safely is 30% cash equity, 70% loans. All right. Now, I want to break each of those down and I want to talk about them in a, a bit more detail. All right. Now, the 30% cash injection, I want to talk about the three primary paths that people use in order to fund that 30%. All right, first, some people just draw that directly out of their savings. They say, look, I've had this money set aside for an investment for a period of time, and I'm going to take money out of that savings account, and that's going to be my 30% cash injection into the business. Great. Terrific option. No issues with that at all. I would say that that's the primary path that people use that I work with. Okay, now, option two, I think, is quite interesting. I have some candidates that I work with who look at their 401k account, and they say, wow, this, uh, this has been a pretty good year. <laughs> After a really bad March in 2020 in the stock market, since that bottomed out, things have been up and up and up and up and up and up and up, and I've got this growing balance in my 401k. I want you to understand that you can roll that money over and you can use a portion of that money as your down payment for your business. Now, I want to be crystal clear with you. I'm putting my CPA hat on now. I'm not proposing that you take a distribution. I'm not proposing that you take a loan. I am proposing that you do a specific program called a retirement account rollover. This allows you to utilize that money with no taxes, no interest, no penalty, all right? So instead of investing in a portfolio of stocks and bonds and index funds, instead, you're gonna take a portion of that money and you're gonna invest in your own corporation. So view this really as simply an alternative investment that your 401k account is making, okay? Your 401k account is technically the owner of the business. Now you control the 401k, the 401k controls the corporation so you can make the leadership decisions 
you can pay yourself a salary, you can pay your other business expenses, including your employees. So everything operates the same. The only difference is that your 401k account will own the business, okay? So I want you to understand that that's a completely viable option, and this is not some goofy strategy that I just came up with. This is a legitimate strategy that's been used thousands and thousands of times in the past, okay? Third alternative, you can find a partner. And this is actually pretty commonly done in the franchise world, is that there's a tag team between an operating partner who maybe doesn't have a whole lot of capital to invest, but they have time, energy, and smarts. And they're tag teaming with a finance partner who has capital, but they have other commitments with their time that they don't want to operate the business on a full-time basis, but they do want to be an investor. They want to financially participate, just not with their time and their energy. Those partnerships work really well in franchising because it allows both of those parties to leverage what they do best. The operating partner is stepping in with the drive and the desire to succeed, and the finance partner is stepping in with the opportunity to earn a better rate of return on their money, and it often to also be a mentor to that new business owner. So I want you to realize that those options to find a partner, highly successful. All right, now, Let's talk about the remaining portion of the capital structure, which is loans, all right? I wanna talk about some varied alternatives here. So first and foremost, the rule that I want you to remember, banks love franchises, <laughs> um, and there's a reason why. Banks are in the business of lending money to people when they feel confident that they're going to be repaid. And at a franchise, the bank has the opportunity to go back and look at the history of that franchise and understand that there's a long track record of success with this brand, and it builds their confidence that this is going to be a loan for which they're going to be repaid. All right, so that's a really good thing. The banks love to lend into franchising. Okay, now the primary loan tool that's used in franchising is a loan, an SBA loan, backed by the Small Business Administration. So you go to your local bank, they lend you the money, but they have a backstop. They have a security mechanism, which is the Small Business Administration tells the bank, listen, if for some reason this loan doesn't go well and you end up losing money, we, the SBA, will reimburse you for your losses. Not 100%, but a partial reimbursement. And so it gives the bank a little bit of extra incentive to say, listen, even if we're not 100% sure about this, the SBA is backing us up. We're willing to make the loan. That's the vast majority of franchising loans. Okay, now, two other loan options that I want you to just factor in. Okay, one, you may have owned your house for a significant period of time. You may, over those years, have accumulated significant equity in your house. You can borrow some of that equity. The interest rate on that dramatically lower the difficulty of getting that loan dramatically reduced. Um, and so for some people, using a home equity line of credit is actually the easiest, most preferred way for them to borrow, okay? It's an alternative. The last loan alternative I want to tell you about are margin loans. So for an investment account that is not a qualified retirement account, so take out your IRAs, take out your Roth accounts, take out your 401k. Those are not eligible for this. If you have other investments sitting at your brokerage house, you can set up a margin loan against those securities and you can borrow a portion of the value of those securities. All right. That to me, I think is pretty interesting because you're really just borrowing your own money. Once again, interest rates on those loans are typically lower and they are less burdensome to actually get the loan, apply for the paperwork and all of that stuff. So I just want you to know that's also a viable alternative, okay? All right, this gets us to the point where now people are saying, okay, I understand what the options are, I understand what my income opportunity is, I understand the investment levels, what am I actually gonna do every day? What does it look like to be a franchise owner, all right? So what I would propose to you is that there are really three very different 
owner's roles in a business. And I want to talk for a minute about each of these three. We're going to label these as an owner operator where you are directly involved in the business every day. An executive owner where I'm going to call you indirectly involved on a daily basis or a semi-absentee owner where you're going to be involved indirectly, but not every day, but instead on a weekly or more periodic basis. So let's talk in a little more detail about each of these three models. All right, let's talk about an owner operator. All right, so in this business, I want you to see yourself, you're the center point of everything that happens in the business. All right, you are the touch point for your customers. You are the supervisor for your employees. All right. So this is a business because you're hip deep in the business. You really need to have some passion, interest, love for the business. All right. Because otherwise it's going to become a real drag very quickly. All right. So let me give you an example, a great example of an owner operator style business. So a very successful franchise that's an owner operator model is something called budget blinds. Okay. Budget Blinds is a franchise that does replacement and new window coverings in people's houses and offices, okay? This is a business where the owner is responding to marketing inquiries that come in. They're picking up the phone, they're making appointments, they're going out to someone's house and meeting with the homeowner and talking about the scope of a job, proposing alternatives to them, working with design alternatives, and really being the upfront sales consultant. Then they go back and they do the ordering and they actually procure the goods. And when they come back in, some of the owners even go so far as to being the installer. They go out to the house and they actually have a drill and a screwdriver and a level, and they're actually installing the window coverings. That is a great example of owner operator. You're engaging with your customers, potentially you have a very small team of people that you're leading but you are the face of the internal and external operation. All right, that's model one, that's owner operator. Now, model two is an executive owner. So let's talk about this. This is different because in this business, you're still involved every day as you are at budget blinds, but in an executive owned model, your interaction with the business is through your employee team. All right, so you are not directly interacting with the ground level employees. You're not directly working with the customers. Instead, you're working with all of those folks through a leadership team. All right, so let me give you an example. An example of this is a business like ServePro. So ServePro, you've probably seen their commercials on TV. If you have a fire or a broken water pipe or a, God forbid, a sewer backup in your house, ServePro, these are the people who come into your house and they clean up the mess and they put it back to how it was before the disaster occurred. All right, now, be crystal clear. In ServPro, the owner is not the one in your basement in the middle of the night squeegeeing water out. That's not what the owner does. The owner is doing a completely different role in the business. They are setting strategy. They're meeting with key referral partners. They're building out a team of employees. They're managing the financial aspects. They're making sure that they have the right equipment in the right place. They're running a business. The employees of the business are the ones responding to the calls. They're the ones actually going out and doing the work. Um, so the executive owned model is very different. I want you to think about your job here as financial management, strategy setting and team building. That's what you're doing as an executive owner, all right? Now, I wanna look at a completely different model now, all right? And this model, I will tell you, I think is actually the perfect transition point for someone who wants to migrate from a traditional corporate role and into being a business owner, all right? This is called a semi-absentee owner, all right? In this business model, you are only an owner. You do not have a day-to-day -day operational responsibility because you are going to hire a management team that runs the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Now, at the very beginning of the business, 
are you going to have a heavier role? Yes, absolutely. There's going to be some roles at the beginning that are going to be one-time only commitments that you just have to do because somebody has to do them and there's a lot to do all at the beginning. But once this business gets rolling for a period of time, your time commitment is going to shrink and shrink and shrink down to a status quo of let's call it 10 to 15 hours a week. Okay. The management team is going to handle all of the other day to day aspects of the business. They're going to handle hiring, training, and managing the employees. They're going to handle interacting with the customers. Your role as a semi absentee owner really revolves around three issues. First and foremost, manage the manager. Second, implement the marketing program. So you're not creating it. Typically, the franchisor is creating it. You're implementing it. And third, you're going to manage the financial aspects of the business from the background. Process payroll. Pay the bills. Make sure that your payments or your deposits are being made, that all the credit cards swipe through properly. All right? Those tasks are going to be done on a weekly basis, not an every single day basis. So example of this, think about a hair salon like a Sport Clips, all right? In Sport Clips, the salon stylists that you see when you go into the salon, they're not the owners. The manager who's in charge of that salon is not the owner. The owner is typically sitting somewhere else at their home office. They oftentimes will own multiple salons. And they are really focused on building a team, managing the financials, and implementing the marketing program. All right. So once again, this is a role that many people that I work with use as a transition point out of corporate life and into business ownership life. Because over a period of time, you can slowly, steadily make this progression. All right. So hopefully this gives you some flavor of what do I actually do every day? <laughs> there, it really is highly dependent on which of these models you want to pursue. All right. Now, this is a question that sometimes people get pretty nervous about. So I want to be very direct when we talk about sales and marketing. All right. Here's my general rule. If you're the business owner, you need to be responsible for sales and marketing period. There's no getting around it. Because if you're not responsible for it, nobody else will be. All right. Now, I want to talk about what that means and how you can do that without a large portion of you saying, no thanks. There are different roles that the owner can play when it comes to sales and marketing in the business. You have to figure out which of these works best for you. So, are you going to directly sell to employ to the customers? Are you going to manage a sales team? Or are you going to choose something that's marketing driven? Now, I want to be clear, all of these can be very successful. It all depends on what your sales acumen and sales comfort is, and what you want to do and what you don't want to do. If you if I say to you, how do you feel about sales? And you lean in and you look at me right in the eye and you say, you know what, Chris? I'm the best salesperson I've ever met. If that's you, then we're going to find a business that allows you to leverage that talent and allows you to really reach out and develop relationships with your customers and you be the driver of that effort. If I ask you that same question and you say, listen, Chris, I'm sales comfortable but I don't really want to be out on the road every single day calling on customers. That's okay. If you're sales comfortable and you have that experience set, let's find a business where you can lead a team of salespeople. You can train them. You can develop their skill set, but you don't have to be the one on the front lines doing it every day. Now, the third option, I want to be really clear. There are a whole array of franchises that are very successful on a marketing driven basis. They don't require any direct sales function at all. So one of my favorite franchise brands in the country is Duncan. All right, I know I've mentioned it now three times in this presentation today. Um, when was the last salesperson who called on you from Duncan? Never. They don't have a sales team calling on their customers. It's a marketing driven organization and they've been pretty successful over the years. There are a lot of franchises that fall into that bucket where they're marketing driven and that's all you need. 
So if you have no interest in sales at all, that's okay. There are franchises that can be very, very successful without needing to have a sales engine on the front. All right, so hopefully that gives you a, a really good understanding and comfort level around what the sales and marketing efforts look like in your business. All right, this is one of the hardest questions that people ask me, all right? What's the best franchise, all right? I'm gonna draw a parallel for you. This is identical to me asking you, what's the best restaurant in Pittsburgh? Which, what's the best movie of all time? Who's the best performing artist you've ever seen? The answer is, it depends. And it depends on a hundred different variables. So I wanna dig into this question a little bit more to give you some more insights, all right? This question really depends on what you want, okay? Now, there are countless different variables, and this is where we really need to sit down, and you need to start thinking about what you want and offer some guidance. Here's the way I think about this, all right? There are really four primary factors that go into what a what is going to make a really perfect franchise for you. And it's gonna be unique to you. It's gonna be different for me or for somebody else that I'm talking to. We talked about these four primary factors already. What's the owner's role in the business? Do you wanna be an owner operator, an executive owner, a semi-absentee owner? All right, that's the first of these primary criteria. Second, what sales and marketing role are you comfortable with? Do you want to be a direct salesperson? Do you want to manage a sales team? Do you want something that's mostly marketing led? Okay. And then the third and fourth criteria really revolve around dollars and cents. All right. How much capital do you want to invest between you and partners? How much capital do you want to invest? And how much income do you want to derive from the business? Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. If we can get a really good answer to those four questions, and we can have clarity around that, we can narrow in very significantly from a universe of, in the US today, about 3,500 different franchise brands, we can realistically narrow into 50, 25, <laughs> that are really laser focused on what you want. It, that, those four questions take that universe from it's the size of a neighborhood to it's the size of a single room, okay? And that's when we start now moving into some of these secondary factors. Where do you wanna be located? There are some businesses that may not work as well in Pittsburgh as they work in Miami, all right? There may be some businesses where the best territories in a market have already been taken by somebody who came before you, all right? A second criteria that I think is important, employee-related businesses. Do you want to have a business with a lot of employees or not a lot of employees? Certain types of employees, all right? All of those employee-related questions tend to actually rise pretty high in the characteristics pile. Do you have preferences on industry? I have some folks that I work with who really don't care what the industry is. That's me. I've purchased businesses over the years in a multitude of different industries. That's not important to me. Others. Really, that is a very important consideration to them. And then brand maturity, I think, is a really important characteristic to understand. There are some brands that are just, they're young. They're young. They might only have 10 or 15 open locations. That doesn't make them bad. It just makes them young. So I would tell you those businesses typically have a higher risk assessment, but they also have probably more market opportunity that the best territories are still available. If you want something that's a very mature brand, you might be choosing from territories that aren't as prime. So I think brand maturity is another really important consideration for us to factor in. So when we look at these primary and secondary factors, I think if we get good answers to these, you can narrow in pretty quickly on what a good franchise opportunity looks like. Now, just a note. After this presentation, if you go online and you start Googling best franchise blank, right? Best restaurant franchise, best home service franchise, best healthcare franchise, all right? All of these best of rankings are gonna pop up. 
What I'm going to tell you is that the vast majority of them aren't worth uh, you clicking on, all right? Simply because they are just paid advertisements. Uh, the companies pay to participate to be on the list. The top 30 this, the top 20 that, the top 10 of these, all right? Don't believe them. I will tell you that I think there's three lists that are better than others. Not perfect, but they're better, all right? So Entrepreneur Magazine, every January, they publish a list called the Franchise 500. I think it's a decent list. I, I don't think their criteria is perfect, but it's at least a starting point for conversation, all right? A better source, uh, every, well, let's call it periodically because they don't do it every year, but periodically, uh, Forbes Magazine publishes a franchising study. That I actually think is better. Those, they stratify it by income levels and they actually have some, in my opinion, better screening criteria around their rankings. So I think that's a really good uh, study to read. And then the third one, if you start digging into specific franchises and that company has um, had a review conducted by Franchise Business Review, read that report cover to cover. <laughs> um, so FBR, what they do is a franchise company can engage them to perform a review. And once the company signs the contract and writes the check, Franchise Business Review ignores the franchisor and doesn't ask them another question. They then turn and they start surveying and asking questions of the franchise owners directly. And they ask them to start ranking their franchise on a, just a countless list of different criteria. And so the insight that you get from an FBR review is pretty significant. So I think that to me is probably one of the most objective measures you could use uh, to really evaluate um, what a good opportunity looks like in franchising. All right, let's talk about success rates for a couple of minutes, all right? So there are thousands of franchise brands in the United States, all right? There are the item 20 in each franchise disclosure document really gives you uh, an identification of very clear statistics about the historical success rate of that brand. The company that I work with at Franchise, we do our best to try to screen and find opportunities that have a better chance of success than others based on our review of that franchise disclosure document. But I think that item 20 in the disclosure document, it's objective information. And so I think that is where you should turn to really start understanding, okay, how many franchises were there at the beginning of the year three years ago? And what's happened over these past three years? How many new units have opened? How many old units have closed? How many transferred from one owner to another? Were there any that the franchise were reacquired? And I think understanding that flow really gives you a pretty clear picture and objective data about the success rate of the brand. So if you're gonna dig in to a franchise investigation, what does that process look like? What are you going to do to objectively evaluate if a particular franchise matches your criteria and if it looks like a good investment opportunity to you, all right? I tend to look at this in phases, all right? So your first phase is really all of your due diligence process. And from my experience, this normally takes eight or 10 weeks, all right? So we're sitting here now early in the springtime. If you started a process today, this is a process that from now where we are at the, you know, at the end of March, you could easily be done with a thorough investigation process by the middle of June, all right? Having gone through each of the different phases in the process. Then you move into phase two. Once you've decided that this is the right franchise for you and you've signed your franchise agreement, now we're really into startup phase, all right? We're into, let's go select a site. Let's build out our space. Let's get trained. Let's hire our initial team, all right? 
there's a pretty wide variability in phase two about how long that takes. If you have a services-based business, this might only be four weeks. For you to get things set up, find a small office location, get your training done, it may be a very short window. If it's a retail business, it's a much longer process. And realistically, it might take you six or nine or 12 months. All right, It's going to take you that long because you have to identify a location. You have to negotiate a much more extensive lease. Then you have to build out your space. Then you're finally ready to start operating the business. And that all of those steps just take significantly longer when it's a retail-based business. All right? And then once you finally swing the doors open, then we're moving into phase three. And phase three to me is how long does it take you from you start on day one and now you have a customer until you are profitable? And that there's a pretty wide variation again in that. And a lot of it depends on what the effectiveness of the marketing is. And a lot of it depends on how much overhead cost you have in the business. In general, services-based businesses are going to be profitable faster. We talked about this at the beginning. Service, faster profitable than retail. Business to consumer, faster than business to business. Owner-operator, profitable faster than if you hire a manager. Right? So I, the faster you want to go up that curve, let's go back and think about some of those other characteristics we talked about before. All right. This first phase of franchise due diligence, I think, really has three different phases. There's a foundational phase where you're really building an education base by talking to the leadership team in the franchise. Then you're going out and having conversations with the current franchise owners, and you're validating your beliefs about the business. And then your final stage is you're going to go through a confirmation phase where you're actually going to go meet the leadership team face to face, shake their hand and look at here's who I'm going to be business partners with. How do I feel about that? And likewise, they're doing exactly the same observation of you. Is this a person that we think can properly execute our business model that we want to be business partners with? Let's talk a little bit about next steps. So when I talk to folks about looking at a franchise investment, my recommendation to them is always really clear. Treat this the same way that you would treat buying a house, all right? You're gonna go through and you're gonna set some very basic criteria, and then you're gonna start researching those basics. How many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, do I need a yard, do I need a garage? What school district do I wanna live in? Those are the basics. And then once you've set that basic criteria, most people then go out and they engage an expert. Most folks go and they find a real estate agent to work with to represent them through the process because that person normally has the inside track to the best opportunities. And they can also help you to avoid a whole lot of potholes along the way by educating you about what you should and shouldn't be doing at every step of the process. That roadmap of success in buying a house is the exact same process that I recommend in a franchise, all right? I would love to serve that capacity. If this is something that's of interest to you, I'll work with you one-on-one -on -one to understand where you are, present you with some pre-identified options that I think match your criteria, and then I'll guide you step-by-step to start making good decisions about how to investigate, get answers to your questions, and make sure that you are making the right franchise investment decision for you. All right. My contact information uh, is up on the screen. And you feel free to reach out to me at any time. You can pick up the phone and call me. You can text me. Send me an email message. Or you can go to my website, chrissimcar.com. And you can feel free on there to peruse all of the additional information that I have and really dig into more detail about any of the topics that we discussed today, from the owner's role to finances to how can I get a bank loan to what is this actually going to look like when I start up the business and what are the realities of being a small business owner. So if I go back around on what we talked about at the beginning, I'm, I want to be very clear with you. I think that business ownership is the best career path that you could choose for yourself. 
And I really think that franchising is the best of both worlds. It gives you the upside opportunity that I think you're looking for, but it does so within the context of a support structure and scaffolding that makes sure that you're supported every step of the way. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation today. If you have further questions, please reach out to me and let's have a one-on-one -on -one conversation so that you make sure that you're getting answers to the questions that you have and we can talk about your specific goals and objectives. Thank you very much for your time.